Who's more Web 2.0, gay people or straight people? Why are you not wearing a flag pin? And what happened in Pennsylvania? No, really, what happened? I have no idea. Welcome to Flaming Politics, your independent look at the issues affecting the LGBT community. I'm Jaffe Grant. We're going to get to Pennsylvania in just a moment, but first, here are the headlines you need to be talking about this week. You're forgiven if you think this is the setup for a joke about porn. A new study by Harris Interactive finds that gay people use the internet more than straight people, but it's not hot male-for-male -male action that's driving them to the web. It's blogs. The survey found that 28% of gay and lesbian adults reported reading news and current issue blogs. That's compared to 19% for their heterosexual peers. And on top of that, 23% of gay people say they read political blogs, eh, eh, as opposed to 14% for straights. All in all, 51% of gays and lesbians reported reading blogs on a regular basis. The het number, 36. John McCain's home state of Arizona may have a second chance at enshrining bigotry into its constitution. After voters narrowly defeated a same-sex ban amendment in 2006, the Arizona House of Representatives has sent a narrow amendment to the Senate, which outlaws gay marriage in the constitution. Should the Senate approve the measure, Arizona voters would see it on this November's ballot. Says Marty Rouse of the Human Rights Campaign, we can expect this November a pure marriage ban to be on the ballot. And now it's time to hear from you in the comment of the week. This week's comment comes from RJ from After Elton in a post titled, I had a feeling the flag lady was a political plant. He says, I would have asked her if she didn't think running for the highest public office in the country was already indicative of one's patriotism. No doubt she voted for W in the last two general elections because he favors wearing flag pins. Gee, look at the mess that sort of patriotism got the country into. First off, spelling favors with a U is pretty unpatriotic, RJ. We fought a war to get rid of that U. Also not to have to say words like schedule and charade. But flag lady, whose real name is Nash McCabe, I just realized some of you may have no idea what I'm talking about. So flag lady is this woman at the Pennsylvania debate who asked Obama why he doesn't wear flag pins and if that made him a bad American. In fact, she was the subject of a New York Times article printed on April 4th, that's two weeks before the debate, in which she said, I watch him on TV. I keep looking for that lapel pin. And while the questions that were given at the debate were supposedly by undecided voters, Miss McCabe said in the article, I just won't vote for him. So, RJ, I guess if you define a plant as someone whose opinions are already known and was sought out to say a specific thing, maybe you have a point. So, before I get to this week's big story, I have a favor to ask of you. I'd like to do an upcoming episode of Flaming Politics where all I do is answer your questions. But to do that, I need some questions. Uh, they can be about whatever you want. Although, considering this is a, a video column about politics, that might be a good place to start. You can either leave the questions for me in the comments box below, or if you want, you can mail them to me at mail at flamingpolitics.com. Pretty easy, right? As always, I read all of the comments. Uh, I really appreciate them. Keep them coming. I can only get to one a week uh, and still actually cover the news and all the other stuff I want. But um, thanks again, and thanks for watching. And now, for the big story. Greetings, people of the future. So, by the time you watch this, the Pennsylvania primary will be a thing of the past. But for me, it's still something that's 18 hours into the future. I thought of picking some other topic to talk about this week that would be less time dependent. But frankly, it's all I can think about, and it's all you want to talk about, I'm sure. And besides, Pennsylvania is such a cruel mistress. Just take a look at these polls. Like Tom Selleck said on the now sadly canceled show Las Vegas, Danny McCoy and Sam Marquez, I love you forever. Anything can happen! And so I'm going to cover all my bases by covering all likely outcomes of the primary. Hopefully, one of them will be right. By the way, this will probably be a lot more entertaining if you've seen the movie Clue. It was the upset that nobody expected! Barack Obama manages to get a few point lead over Hillary Clinton, thereby winning Pennsylvania, thereby winning the Democratic nomination. Though Hillary Clinton is yet to concede, she's promised a major campaign announcement in the next couple days in Chappaqua. How did he do it? Let me tell you. It was the suburbs that did it. 
While Obama was expected to do well in the cities like Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, the fact that he also had an extremely strong showing in the suburbs managed to put him over the top. Many of these outlying suburbs had traditionally been Republican, but because of the huge turnout this primary brought, many of them switched to Democrat, and many of them voted for Barack Obama. This is important because it's the suburbs, not rural areas, not cities, that have managed to pick the correct presidential candidate the last few cycles. The fact that Obama was able to carry these key areas shows that beers, bowling, and flag lapel pins were all red herrings. Bring out the Rocky Balboa metaphors! Hillary's just had a blowout! One, two! That's me trying to punch! 20 points! Maybe even more once all the votes are counted up. And how did she do it? Turns out when Pennsylvanians say, Hillary, we've got your back, they really mean it. Hillary's core constituencies really came through. Add on top of that the support of Governor Ed Rendell on the Pennsylvania political machine, and she managed to score up big where she needed to, as well as make inroads into Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, all the places where Obama was expected to do well. This is exactly what Hillary wanted to have happen. Now she can really make the case to the superdelegates that she managed to cut into Obama's delegate lead as well as his popular vote lead, and while she may never actually make it up, she now has won many, many large contests, including Ohio, and Texas, California. Now, her argument really has some real meat to it. And while Obama is still winning, this kind of boost is the reprieve Hillary needs to move forward into North Carolina and Indiana. She now has new energy, new strength, and who knows what the future will bring. Turns out that Bosnia was just a red herring. <sighs> so Pennsylvania. You had a real chance to end this, or to... Change the game one way or the other. And what did you do? You had Hillary Clinton win by, say, five to eight points, thereby guaranteeing the process goes on without a clear winner. Obama says he won because, you know, there wasn't a blowout, and Hillary says she won because a win is a win. Well, this is exciting and all for the people of Guam who get to vote soon, but for the rest of us, well, it's starting to get a little tiring. Even the candidates are getting kind of grumpy. Couldn't you made up your mind? And the reports of a whole bunch of Obama supporters and Clinton supporters converging in the small town of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania to duke it out, is starting to make people think that, hey, maybe this whole spiel about this being bad for party unity is maybe true. Plus, it is getting sort of hard to figure out how in a general election you're going to say you can lead the country if, as a party, you can't even lead yourselves. Meanwhile, John McCain is looking like a more attractive candidate every day. Even though he says idiotic things like, I'm definitely anti-anything, I don't even know what that means. It's sad to say, though, that it's starting to look like a Democratic victory in November is nothing more than a red herring. This is Jaffe Grant, and you've been watching Flaming Politics here on Visible Vote.